currently the Regius Professor of Medicine at Oxford University. Following graduation from the University of Alberta in 1975, Sir John undertook his medical training in the UK as a Rhodes Scholar, subsequently studying at Stanford University before returning to the UK in 1987. His research interests are in the area of autoimmune disease and immunology, hence uh, the COVID, uh, his COVID involvement, and where he has continued uh, to study the understanding of immune activation in a range of autoimmune diseases. In 1993, he founded the Wellcome Trust Center for Human Genetics, one of the world's leading centers for complex trait, common disease genetics. In 2001, he was appointed non-executive director of Roche Holdings, and in 2008, he joined the Gates Foundation Global Health Advisory Board, which he's chaired since 2012. During this time, Sir John served as president of the Academy of Medical Sciences in the UK as well. In December of 2011, Prime Minister David Cameron appointed Sir John one of two life science champions. Most impressively, Sir John was appointed Knight Grand Cross of the Order of the British Empire in the 2015 New Year Honours for services to medicine, medical research and the life sciences industry. He sits on the board of Genomics England Limited, chairs its Scientific Advisory Committee and chaired the Office of Strategic Coordination of Health Research until recently. More to the point of our discussion today, in August of 2017, the UK Life Sciences Industrial Strategy written by Sir John was published. The report written in collaboration with industry, academia, charities and research organizations provides recommendations for Her Majesty's Government on the long-term success of the life science sector. Any of these experiences would make for interesting discussion, but it's the nuggets for success of the life science industrial strategy that are focus of our discussion in the next hour. I'm not sure if he's uh, here with us yet, but uh, at the right time, I'd hope that you'd join me in welcoming. Uh, I'm, I'm here, so thanks. Fantastic. <laughs> well, well, welcome, Sir John. That's great. Sorry I was a bit late, and thanks for that um, perhaps overly complimentary introduction. I, I like to tell people that when I, when I was appointed Regis Professor of Medicine, um, I had a call from Stan Peart, who's one of the most distinguished chairman of medicine in the country, and he said, look, JB, he said, I hope you realize that the in Oxford, the Regis Professor of Medicine is to the faculty what the lamppost is to the dog. So that puts it all rather more in context. So look, thanks so much for having me. I think I, I was asked by your team whether I might just give us a bit, give you a bit of a, an oversight of how we've been thinking about life sciences in the UK actually for quite a long period of time, but most recently around the life science strategy, which I wrote in 2016, 2017. And so I've put together some slides, which will hopefully illustrate that. Can, can I ask you to move it on when I ask you to do that? It's probably, probably the easiest thing. So next slide. So um, after we took the decision to leave the European Union with the Brexit vote, um, there was obviously a lot of scrambling around to work out what we would do from an economic growth perspective. And it was decided that it was appropriate for the UK to take on something that it hadn't done really since the late 60s, which is to invest in an industrial strategy. Now, industrial strategy had a relatively bad reputation because when Harold Wilson did it, um, it was mostly designed to prop up um, the coal and the steel industries, in other words, failing sectors that needed additional financial aid. So it rapidly developed a pretty bad reputation. But <clears throat> with, the, with the new government, with Theresa May's government um, after the Brexit vote, it was decided that actually strategically investing in certain sectors was probably a wise thing to do, in part because that was, it was a very active, um, uh, agenda for many of the most successful economies around the world is to choose sectors that you think you can win in. And life sciences has been historically strong in the UK. So it was decided to 
invest in this sector. They asked me to write the report, which is here, uh, which you can find online. But it was a pretty interesting process because we got together a, an advisory group of about 30 or 35 people, mostly from industry, but a few of the funders, both charitable and government funders. And we, laid, we decided to lay out a plan for the UK, which they could pursue. And uh, now we can look back really three and a half years later, one of, year, one of those years was a COVID year. So it, we sort of stopped doing much about a year ago. But in total, the government has put in about six to 700 million pounds into supporting the strategy. And it's returned about three and a half billion pounds of inward investment. So it's been a, it's been a terrific run for us. And, uh, uh, and as a result, we've just been asked to redo a sort of version 2.0 of the strategy, which I'll talk about a bit later in the, in the, in the speech. So next slide, please. So the fundamentals, one of the reasons we did this is the fundamentals are pretty good in the UK. We've got a fantastically strong science base. We've got Nobel prizes up the wazoo. We've got three of the top 20 medical research programs in the world by almost all the league tables and two of the top 10 universities globally, including the, by the times higher supplement, the top university globally is Oxford. So we're in a pretty strong position in terms of the science base. We've got the largest biotech cluster outside the US and that's been hugely powerful and continues to grow year on year. We've got a broad single payer cradle to grave health data and health care infrastructure, which turns out to be perhaps one of our most important USPs. We've also got one of the most innovative drug regulators. We were always the most innovative drug regulator in Europe when we were part of the EMA. We're now an independent regulator and that's simply fueled up the ambition to try and make this the world's most innovative and most active and progressive drug regulator. And it, we also were helped by the fact that this is the most productive sector in the UK economy. Next slide, please. And, and just to show you the kind of infrastructure that's been going in and repeated governments all the way back to Tony Blair have been very, very committed to building out life sciences infrastructure. And these are just a few of the examples of things that have happened in the UK to build, I think, really world-class infra infrastructure, perhaps uh, as good as any in the world. And things like the Crick Institute, which has gone up recently, which is a really important flagship based in London. Everybody knows the Sanger, which has been one of the global leaders in the genomics field. Um, the, the Harwell campus has both the Diamond Synchrotron, which is a globally leading synchrotron adjacent to the Rosalind Franklin Institute, which is an institute that supports uh, life sciences and engineering, chemistry and uh, physics, uh, all in the same building. And then a couple of examples of the kind of campuses that have emerged. The Addenbrooke's campus at Cambridge dramatically expanded with the presence of AstraZeneca and our own Old Road campus in Oxford. Both these campuses hold between about 2,000 and 2,500 <coughs> scientists. So these are big by any standard and has really moved the UK very close to the front of the, the queue in terms of the size and scale of our investment infrastructure. Next slide, please. Um, the other key element of the UK is although we've got a lot of life sciences around the mm -hmm. UK, and in fact, if you look at the total jobs around the UK, about 60% of the life sciences jobs are outside of the southeast of England. Uh, but the, the, the most intense uh, area is obviously the Oxford, Cambridge, um, London uh, triangle. And, and this has great advantages because it's an hour from London to Oxford, an hour from London to Cambridge. And we're right in the process of finishing the railway between Oxford and Cambridge, which will make it an hour from Oxford to Cambridge. They've all got lots of biotech companies um, uh, and a, a massive amount of investment in the biotech and the life sciences sector. Um, and the other feature, which we are unique, and in fact, well ahead of both Boston and San Francisco, is the, the truth is Boston and San Francisco are relatively small financial centers, where London is anything but a small financial center. And indeed, in pension funds in London, there's about three and a half trillion pounds of 
money invested. So the opportunity to use London as the major source of financing for this sector is a huge opportunity. And I'll come back to that in a minute. Next slide, please. So um, I've shown you a little bit of the bricks and mortar, but it's more than bricks and mortar that's made the life sciences environment. And this has been a 20 year project. Some of us have been at it really. I took the job running the, academic, uh, the uh, Academy of Medical Sciences in 2005 and took the chair of Oscar in 2006. And really since then, which is about 15 years, we've been building very substantial, broad capabilities across the country. Obviously we have a strong funding base, which covers everything from fundamental basic science through translational science and experimental medicine through late stage clinical trials and also applied science in the clinic. And, and it's really important if you're gonna do this to have all of it. In the old days, we used to only do basic science. And I think we've really added a lot by adding the more translational elements to this. The funders are coordinated through a single vehicle, which is called the Office for Strategic Coordination for Health Research, which has no powers of executive powers, but helps, helps to coordinate the funders to get them to do things in a much more organized and orchestrated way. And that's a project that's been in place since 2006 and has worked really well. We've also got a substantial commitment from the health system, from the NHS, which is really important. They view themselves as being a significant party to the evolution of the life sciences in the UK. And I know this is a concept which is relatively foreign in the Canadian setting of healthcare systems because the, the ability to grow economic growth around life sciences and the health system are dealt with as rather separate pods. The linkage of these two is crucially important and they really relate to the ability of the life sciences industry to generate income, generate tax, and that tax, of course, goes back to help pay for our healthcare system. So the two things are intimately linked, and there are lots of ways that they can overlap. And we've created a set of academic health sciences centers, NHS hospitals and associated universities, and also <coughs> academic health sciences networks, which are regional groups of hospitals and universities that work together. We've got a national clinical trial pro program which I'll talk about a bit later. We've got a number of national flagship projects that are now globally um, important. UK Biobank, which we started in about 2002, now the world's biggest and most successful genomic epidemiology biobank. Genomics England, which of course has done the 100,000 genomes and is now working on five, 500,000 genomes from the healthcare system. And our Future Health, which is our new cohort, which is a 5 million person cohort looking at early diagnosis of disease. Uh, and then a set of translational research centers and biomedical research centers, which are focused very much on translational medicine funded by the NHS through its research arm, the NIHR, a set of centers of excellence. I've showed you pictures of those and also a, a, an increasingly integrated digital infrastructure, which I don't wanna make too much about because we're not quite there yet. Next slide, please. <coughs> so the reason, another reason that we decided this was a good place to play was when you look at us compared to the US and Germany and France and Israel, and you look at the public spend per weighted publication, we're actually hugely efficient. Um, and you can see that we get, uh, for, for, for the amount of money we spend, we get a terrific uh, amount of output in terms of publications. I, um, uh, we, we, where we don't do so well is weighted publications per patent. So we're not very good at patenting uh, our IP yet. And you can see that we fall behind the other economies in that space, but we do really well on most of the issues that are related to GVA, jobs per public spend. Again, we're winning by usually a factor of two or more gross value added per public spend. Again, we beat everybody easily um, except uh, uh, Israel, who are pretty close to us. So we're internationally pretty competitive in this space, and it's important to recognize where you're winning and where you're losing in these domains. Next slide, please. And, and also crucially, we're, there, the UK has a big problem with productivity, and we've been soul searching about how to improve our productivity. And so there's a lot of analysis of which sectors are the most productive. And it turns out that in 2015, when we looked at our productivity figures, and these are 
somewhat arbitrary economist assessment of productivity based on output per hour. But you can see the most productive sector in the UK economy is undoubtedly pharmaceuticals and chemicals, chemicals being substantially less um, impressive. And what's also interesting is that the least productive sector is financial services. Um, now, they, they make a lot of money, but in terms of output, it's not uh, anywhere near so impressive. So if you wanted to invest in improving productivity, you expand the pharmaceuticals industry and the life sciences industry in the UK. Next slide, please. So just to <coughs> take you through the highlights of the first strategy, we obviously wanted the science base in the UK to be strengthened. We got massive commitments for uplift in the science budget from the UK government at that time to support that growing more than two and a half fold over the course of the next six years. We wanted to improve our abilities in clinical science, particularly looking at clinical trials as a largely unreformed domain that could be made much better. We wanted to scale the growth of, of innovative companies. We've got, we've got a lot of small uh, companies and a few mid-sized companies, but we've had a very hard time scaling them to mid to large size biopharmaceutical companies. So that was an objective. And then we identified really rich areas for new opportunities in the sector. And we agreed, I think not very cleverly, that we would push quite hard on uh, advanced therapeutics, viral vectors, nucleic acid-based therapies uh, as a big push in the sector. And we've had enormous success in that space, both with small companies and with academic developments. We needed to resolve a fundamental adoption problem in the NHS, um, which was to adopt things faster and enable small companies to find a market in the, in the UK, and also to create a new independent regulator. And then Ultimately, we decided that we would try and create three new life sciences industries in the UK. And in order to that, in order to do that, we need to decide which were the three areas that were most likely to develop into major new global industries. And by that, I don't mean new pharmaceutical industries. These are new industries in life sciences that will contribute in the same way that pharma or the diagnostics industry has in the past. So next slide, please. So th this was a subject of a lot of debate in our advisory board. And the three areas that we chose, the first one you won't be surprised to hear is genomics. We've got a tradition in genomics in the UK that goes all the way back to Darwin, but also included Fred Sanger, who developed sequencing of DNA and also uh, all the exciting work on the genome that's been done at the Sanger Center and on things like polygenic risk scores. Um, so genomics was number one. The second big area that we were focused on was digital health. And we do have the benefits of an integrated data record across 55 million people in the NHS in England. And this seemed to us, given the importance of digital tools going forward, linking very tightly, of course, to genomics was gonna be very important. And then the third area, which may seem a little bit out of line, but I'll explain it to you in more detail in a minute, was the whole area of early diagnosis. And this was really based on the argument that almost all healthcare systems in developed economies focus very much on late stage diagnosis and late stage therapy. People arrive in the casualty department, they got a lump in their tummy, they've got a cancer, they get treated for stage four cancer and then they die. So if healthcare systems are gonna become more sustainable, they have to move to a much earlier phase of diagnosis. And there's a lot of technology here that's gonna allow that to happen, not least of which uh, genomics, but also early diagnostic tools like ctDNA, much better imaging, polygenic risk scores, and the like. So we decided that that was likely to become a really dominant um, area for ex expansion of the life sciences. Next slide, please. I'll just take you through these quickly one at a time. In, in genomics, we're pretty much unequaled globally for our large-scale genomics project. UK Biobank, of course, we finished uh, four years ago, uh, doing 820K SNP chip across all 500,000 individuals. Uh, the exomes are almost finished. <coughs> and I'll talk to you about our genome project in a second. Genomics England, again, 2019, we completed the first 100,000 genomes in a healthcare setting, rare disease and cancer. And we're now doing 100,000 rare disease and cancer genomes a year 
to try and bump that number up, hopefully to 500,000 within the near future. And then finally, in our early diagnostic cohort, which is important, we, um, we are um, definitely interested in um, expanding uh, that in a significant way. Um, so that you can see that one of the intentions in the early diagnostic cohort is to, is to, is to study 5 million participants, do polygenic risk scores across all 5 million, and then we're just in the process of developing a plan to do exomes across the whole 5 million cohort. So on large scale genomics, we're pretty much unequaled, I think, globally. Next slide, please. And around that, we've developed a national genomic strategy where we look at clinical genomics with Genomics England, the genotype phenotype stuff that we can do in UK Biobank, and then public health genomics, which is really um, a, a common variant analysis uh, using polygenic risk scores. So the, the national genomic strategy is one that's bought into by the whole of the NHS. We're pushing hard on that using both research studies and non-research studies. Next slide, please. So I, I mentioned that we're now doing whole genomes of the whole of the UK Biobank. We're about halfway through, and this is a good example of how the industrial strategy is played. Uh, this was uh, a, a collaboration between four um, uh, major pharmaceutical companies, J and J, Amgen, AstraZeneca, and GSK. Um, sequencing is being done by Decode in Iceland and the Sanger Center. Um, it was set up really to be a two-year project. We missed a year because of COVID, but we should be finished it in a year's time. And the first half of the genomes will be made publicly available within the next six months. So this is a really exciting project, largely because we have so much phenotypic data in the UK Biobank, as well as linkage to all the healthcare records, as well as access to imaging data on 100,000 people of heads, hearts, and bodies uh, as another phenotypic measure. Next slide, please. Um, on the data side of things, we again have had a really uh, successful go trying to pull a whole range of different data together. Now this is complex within a healthcare system because data governance is always a big challenge, but I think we're really making progress on this now. We've got very substantial amounts of digital pathology data. Indeed, 27 million people in the UK will be covered by the end of this year, will be covered by digital pathology services. So those are going into a large data set. We've got imaging data, other forms of imaging data with her, which are accessible and obviously genomics data. And between the three of those, you've got really highly digitized data, ideally, for, ideally suited for unsupervised machine, machine learning methodologies. But we've also got data on therapies, clinical phenotype, lab tests, digital monitoring, and that we hope is going to generate a set of algorithms for diagnostics, therapeutic responses, and the likes. Next slide, please. Um, and, and this is just a summary of those things which we've got in the UK. Data assets in total of 65 million, of which 55 million are in England, and the perhaps the best records are GP records for which we have 15 years of legacy data covering off prescription records, hospital discharge data, lab data, and the likes. Coded hospital admission data, pathology data, the cohorts, the registries. This is all pretty powerful stuff. And it's all managed within a single structure in the NHS called NHS Digital. Next slide, please. Uh, this just shows you the type, the wide, a number of types of data that we're collecting, sometimes comprehensively across the whole population, other times in cohorts, and other times in sub-regional subpopulations. But our data, our data resources are getting very strong. And it's been interesting in COVID when we've had to get access to data to understand vaccine efficacy, vaccine complications, uh, um, admissions to hospital, uh, natural course of the disease. It's been very interesting that the, the UK data is undoubtedly by far the best that we've been able to find anywhere. And that's really quite telling because there are lots of European countries who like to think they've got great data, but let me tell you, they don't. So this is, it's, this is hard to do to get all this stuff right. Next slide, please. 
Uh, this is our digital pathology network. I've, I've talked a little bit about this. This course has huge potential for um, machine learning. And this has developed extensively across four or five centers around the UK. And as I say, Leeds is the main hub for our digital pathology program. And they now have enough hospitals to cover off, as I say, 27 million people in the UK. So we're really excited about digital pathology, but also radiology as a part to that. Next slide, please. We're also very interested in using digital tools to improve clinical development and clinical trials. And we've had great success on digitized recruitment into trials, which dramatically reduces the costs of large scale trials. We're trying to revise the ICH GCP guidelines, which are a major impediment to doing digital trials at scale. We've got exemplars running. This is all run out of Oxford through the BDI in Oxford and through uh, NHS Digital. And I'll talk a little bit about some of this in a minute. Next slide. So we've got lots of pieces of data. And one of the big challenges that all healthcare systems have got is hooking these all up into a single common data set. And we've been using NHS Dig Digital to do that. And next slide, please. We've taken these various pieces and we're beginning I won't, I think this is an overstatement of where we are, but this is where we're trying to get to, which is an integrated puzzle where there is interoperability between multiple different data sets and the ability to draw down data on lots of different individual people. Next slide, please. So the final domain, which I mentioned is this whole area of early diagnosis and early intervention. And I think this is a slide that I got from Deloitte, and it's quite interesting because if you look at US health uh, spending at the moment, most of the money is spent on treating disease symptomatically and also late stage disease modification. But if you look out to 2040, the speculation is that actually much more money is going to be spent both on curative interventions, which basically means early interventions in chronic disease and preventative interventions. And that's why we've based a place to bet on this new industry emerging around early diagnosis, public health, early diagnosis, and early interventions in all the major chronic diseases, everything from mental health, inflammatory diseases, uh, chronic airway disease, renal disease, heart disease, cancer, Alzheimer's disease, the whole lot. So we decided to take really take a run at this in a big way. Next slide, please. And that's why we set up the new cohort. It's called Our Future Health. It follows on the great tradition of NHS cohorts, makes use of the digital linkage, but also takes use of the major new diagnostic platforms that have emerged in the last five to 10 years. Obviously proteomics, uh, in vivo imaging, circulating tumor DNA and the likes. And, and also takes, makes use of the fact that AI is much more available. And then when it comes to genetics, it's really clear that polygenic risk scores are going to dramatically change our ability to identify people at risk. And so we've used that and we're using a range of tools to actually recruit patients at a pretty rapid rate to get up to our 5 million cohort. Next slide, please. Um, lots of new technologies. <coughs> I won't go into these in particular detail, but as you know, there are lots of new technologies for early diagnosis, polygenic risk scores for genetic testing, but also the use of digital tools, accelerometer, heart rate monitors and the likes, all of which can be downloaded into a large central database that will hold data on all these 5 million people. Next slide, please. Uh, we also know that early diagnosis is a crucial piece of the puzzle. Um, and I, I, sorry, that's my phone, but we just let that ring. Um, the, the, and this early diagnosis piece we know from experience in cardiovascular disease, if you know about who's at risk, and in that case, people with high blood pressure and high LDL cholesterol, and you intervene early, we've had a staggering reduction in the rates of mortality and morbidity from cardiovascular disease by treating early and treating aggressively with those uh, therapies against risk factors. And similarly, on the right-hand panel, you can see the difference between late and early stage survivals if you diagnose cancer early. So the intention in the UK is to move the number of people diagnosed with stage one or two cancers from 50%, which it is at the moment, to 75%. So that's a 50% increase in the number of people we'll catch early. Next slide, please. 
Um, polygenic risk scores. I won't, for, if you don't know what a polygenic risk score is, I won't spend time, but it's just a, these are common variants that can be typed very cheaply. It's probably about 10 bucks for a chip these days for a million chips. And it gives really powerful indicators of risk across populations. So it can alter your approaches to screening and early interventions in quite a profound way. Next slide, please. Um, and, there, and of course, there's lots of data on this, but the, you, can, you can show, depending on where you are on the curve, if you take people at the high risk end of the curve, you can get a very significant increase in relative risk in populations, uh, I, up to threefold increased risks in people who are in the top decile of risk compared to the bottom decile. So this is, I think, a really powerful way to identify who you want to intervene in early and should change our whole approach, approach to um, public health. Next slide, please. Um, lots of examples of this. This is just a curve. This shows some of the stuff you get from obesity. If you take the high and the low risk populations for obesity polygenic risk scores, you can see that the difference in rate in weight at birth is very little, but by the time you get to eight, there's 3.5 kgs in difference. And by the time you get to 18, it's 12 kgs in difference. So this talks about programming of these major uh, chronic diseases. Next slide, please. So our strategy for this cohort, our future health is what it's called, is to recruit people digitally into a large cohort, take blood samples, store those blood samples, and then evaluate them using questionnaires in a variety of um, uh, subsets of the population being tested and evaluated. The importance of this population is they are recallable. Next slide, please. Um, so just another couple of other quick things, and then I'm gonna stop so we have time for questions. I did mention that we were very focused in the strategy on nucleic acid-based therapies. That's interfering RNAs and DNAs, gene therapy, and of course, increasingly mRNA gene therapy. Um, we've got a lot of programs going on in this basis. There's a lot of new companies established to exploit this. We've established an accelerator to improve the CMC, the manufacturing of these based at Harwell. There's a number of success stories in this space, both Nightstar and Orchard Therapeutics valued at more than a billion dollars. Oxford Biomedica, of course, one of the great CMC uh, places for both lentivirus and adenovirus. And next slide, we've also been collaborating, first of all, with um, the medicines company, but also uh, now with Novartis around this molecule, which is a double-stranded small interfering RNA that inhibits PCSK9. The reason we're interested in this was because it was a test of our ability to do large-scale trials in the NHS. So we're doing two trials. One is called Orion 4, which is a trial of 15,000 people. And the other one is Orion 17, which is a trial of 50,000 people. And we've been able to use our abilities to leverage clinical trials to reduce the cost of these by between 80 and 90%, making these studies doable for a small company. And that's really the reason, next slide, that um, the medicines company were able to sell this, uh, sell themselves to Novartis for um, $10 billion last year was because of their ability to roll out these trials at scale. And you can see what's exciting about this is it's an injectable and you only have to give it once a year to reduce LDL cholesterol by 50%. So this is a whole new world of cardiovascular disease prevention. We're very excited about this because it fits beautifully in the early intervention piece of our national strategy. Next slide, please. Uh, we want to move ourselves in terms of the percentage of spend, um, GDP percent of spend on, on R&D up to 2.4%. Uh, that brings us to the OECD average, and that's where we think we need to be. And the government is busy pushing that quite hard. We're not there yet, but we hope to be able to get there by 2024. So spending more money on R&D is important. Next slide. But one of the things that we realized was that the government can't do all that heavy lifting. Some of that needs to be private capital. And so this issue about how we release private capital from the big pension funds in the city to go into innovative firms and biotech companies has been a very important focus for us in the last year during COVID. And we've just recently announced a large scale funding program. We've recruited five venture capital companies from the US to rehouse themselves in London and 
between the government and investment from the UAE, uh, we're just putting a billion pounds of new investment into this space, hoping to leverage multiples of that from the city, from the large pension funds over the course of the next year or two. Next slide. Uh, we have an ambition of building four companies worth more than 20 billion pounds over the next 10 years. And we're pretty well on the way to that. We've got several now in the multiple billions. We hope we'll be able to get there. But in addition to that, we've got a low tax environment, which is uh, um, nets out at 9% if you include our patent box. We're trying to improve our public capital markets and we've changed the rules on pension funds. Next slide. We're getting close to the end. This is just a diagram of the, of the fund that we're developing. Next slide, please. Um, so where to next? Well, we're very interested in what we do in the next round. We'll be picking up many of the themes I've just described to you before, clinical research, digital data, and AI genomics and early detection, regulation um, and improvement of regulatory environments and advanced therapies. And we're gonna put a particular push in four big areas, cancer, dementia, and aging, pandemic preparedness, and cardiometabolic disease and obesity. So those are the big plays that we were trying to play out in the next little while. Next slide, please. I think that's it. Look, uh, thanks for being so patient. That was a bit rushed, but it gives you a sense about where we think we've gotten to with our strategy so far and what our ambitions are in the future. So very happy to take questions or comments. Um, uh, uh, I'm very happy to turn it over to you and then uh, respond. Thank you very much, John. That There are just so many aspects of this that I want to dive deep into. And I'm also in awe of um, how uh, the collaboration between academia, research, um, you've even brought up pension funds, um, industry. It's amazing. I'd like to introduce Dr. Dermot Kelleher, the Dean of Medicine at UBC. Uh, who is uh, a colleague of uh, Sir John Bell's, um, to say a few words. Dermot, are you, are you there? Someone can stop my video. I'm here. Uh, I think and Brian owns the Brian, keys to that. Brian. Yeah. Okay, thank you very, very much. Um, so, so, so thanks so much, John. That was, a, that was a, an amazing uh, tour through the the last uh, 15 to 20 years, but culminating in, in really some extraordinary developments over the last few years. Um, I just wanted to say uh, by way of introduction that as an academic, I've been privileged to work in four different jurisdictions. And uh, I've worked in Ireland, the UK and Singapore and the US uh, where I, I worked in the 80s uh, at UC San Diego and, and later at, at Lilly Research Labor Laboratories, which took over HyberTech. And, you know, I saw the beginnings of the biotech boom there. And, you know, it's really, really been a fascinating uh, a set of observations. I've also served as a non-executive director for ICON PLC, which is now number two global uh, clinical research organization for 11 years. I just want to make a few quick points. Um, one is, um, you know, I think John has really illustrated superbly that with regard to the life sciences and bioinnovation, there has never been a better point in time when industry, academia, and our health partners are, 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 are aligned in terms of our objectives. And here in BC, we've seen the emergence of outstanding translational science from UBC during the COVID period, uh, with uh, companies like Precision and Acuitas providing the critical delivery uh, vehicles for the RNA vaccines. If you check out the latest issue of Nature Biotechnology, you'll see that graphically illustrated. Abcelera, as we just heard, de delivering an antibody therapeutic, which is brought through with Lilly. And there's also outstanding science coming through from people like Joseph Penninger and Serum Supermanian, who's, who's, who's identified the 3D structure of, of the variants. Um, and I also just want to point out, just by reference to what John is referring to, if you look back about two years, Nature did a feature on quantum computing and uh, highlighted Vancouver as one of the key global uh, areas in the world for this. So there is a, um, a, a, a real capacity to align industry and academia uh, to create a, a, a global framework for bio-innovation. 
And here in BC, we're, we're, we're just starting to see this uh, beginning to develop with the entrepreneurial outputs and spin-outs from our post-secondary systems. The second thing is that we're increasingly aware of the deficits in our system that slow down or inhibit the translational process. And you have heard from John how the, the UK has rectified many of those deficits by embedding research readiness in the health system. And quite frankly, we haven't done that. And, uh, you know, and, and we seriously need to develop first in man uh, clinical trial capability, which the UK has put in place over the last 20 years uh, and to develop our ability to do clinical trials uh, within our health system more effectively so that we can move those discoveries up the value chain, just as John has illustrated. And I think if you look at the, the, the uh, life science industrial strategy document, your first chapter, John, is um, NHS collaboration. You know, it's, it's really striking, collaboration with the health service. And, uh, and, and if we look at um, Karima S. Sabar's report, the HBEST report uh, to Health and Biosciences Economic Strategy, this says we need a health policy environment that sees the health care of Canadians and economic growth of the health and biosciences sector as mutually reinforcing. And, uh, and, and that is uh, really key. And, and John also uh, emphasized the, uh, the importance of the regulatory environment, a flexible, nimble regulatory environment. So, you know, we often talk about bench to bedside science as translational, but it also, it all begins at the bedside. So it's really bedside to bench to bedside to community. And uh, here in BC, I, I think if, if we lead in, in one real area, I think it's in personalized oncogenomics. Uh, the, the POG program at BC Cancer is probably the best in class globally in, in terms of its real world uh, application of whole genome sequencing and transcriptome analysis to real cancer patients in real time and decision making based on that. Um, after this presentation, I'm going to be joining uh, another meeting uh, with, I'll be joining my cousin, uh, Dr. David Fagenbaum. Uh, from Penn. Uh, this J David is a, a young man with, uh, with a very rare condition, Castleman syndrome, who identified his own treatment as a medical student at Penn. He's my cousin. He's, a, he's an extraordinary young man. His book, Chasing My Cure, has been a bestseller. And most importantly, he's developed the framework for how you work with rare, rare diseases. And, uh, it, uh, and, and uh, as, a, as a young man affected with a condition has transformed the way the, 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 the prognosis and the outcomes for Castleman syndrome. So if you look at, at some of his work, you'll see that we do have the capabilities to respond to uh, in, in, in the rare disease space. But lastly, I just wanna, uh, John showed that graph with, showed the uh, investment in R&D and, and the, the uh, as a percentage of GDP and, and the ambitions in, within the report are to substantially boost that. Uh, Canada is actually going in, in the other direction and it's gone down from 2% over a decade ago to about 1.5% now and falling in comparison with our industrial peers. So we do need investment at scale and we do need to think at scale. And, uh, and at that point, I'm just going to give a, another shameless plug to two um, developments that we are putting in place at UBC. And one is the School of Biomedical Engineering, which is uh, really moving really rapidly in the area of regenerative medicine and advanced therapeutics. And the Academy of Translational Medicine, which is a, a grouping which is intended to reduce the time from discovery to implementation. So um, that's a little bit of the BC per, per, and, and Canadian perspective. And back to you, Wendy. Thank you very much. Um, it's, I so wish we had a lot more time. I think one of the things, and, and Dermot, you, you talked a little bit about this, um, is a lot of the building blocks that you talked about early on in your presentation, John, we really feel we have in BC, where we have the, some of the world-class science that, that Dermot was just talking about out of out of UBC and some of our other academic institutions, the quantum computing, um, you know, we don't, I mean, just so envy, I wanna explore into this investment strategy and how you got pension funds excited about life sciences. Um, but we also um, 
you know, so how, how do you bring these building blocks together? We have in, not in Canada, but in BC, a largely single, single payer environment without the private insurance. We have an integrated healthcare system. So how, what advice would you have for us in how we bring this together? Because I feel like you just gave us our roadmap. And I've been getting some texts from people telling me, why can't we do this? Why can't we do this faster as you've been talking? So could you help yeah, us so uh, help us figure out with all these assets that we have and opportunity that we have, what, what advice would you give to us? Yeah, so, so you're absolutely right. I think you're, you've got almost all the bits. Um, and it's it, it, a bit as it was in the UK, some of this was tying it all together. So if you go back 20 years in the UK, the funding agencies fought with each other. They competed for money. They, they didn't work together very coherently. There was a, 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 a transactional relationship between the health system and life sciences companies, but not a collaborative relationship. Academics didn't work very much with industry partners. And there was a sort of slightly snooty attitude that academics didn't need to work with industry partners. And, and it was pretty fragmented and balkanized. Um, and so over the last 20 years, I think one thing that we've done is we've brought everybody together and we've got people working together. They all know each other. They all f talk to each other on the phone. There's no shame in having a friend who's an executive in a pharma or a biotech company. There's opportunities to work across the healthcare system boundaries rather more collaboratively and, and in an interactive way. And, and in many ways, that's one of the things which is very powerful about the UK setting now is it's, it's almost a sociological thing rather than a structural thing. And it was very evident in the COVID pandemic because, you know, literally within a week or two of trouble coming over the English Channel into the UK at the beginning of March, with the, the network of people who we had working together, we're all working together on COVID. So, you know, we had people working together on vaccines, we had people working together on testing, we had people lining up clinical trials together. Uh, we had academics at NHS working together to get everything lined up. And I think, you know, we had a, we had a pretty bumpy start in COVID, but I think it's also fair to say that since about a year ago now, there's probably no country that's done as good a job in, in the full comprehensive set of scientific contributions to the COVID epidemic. And that I think reflects the networks that we built. Now you've got a couple of problems that are probably worth highlighting. And one is for whatever reason, you chased the pharmaceutical company out of Canada, companies out of Canada some years ago. And it's not a great place for pharma. So you do need to think about how you might reintroduce that because they they are a really important piece of the overall puzzle and with this strategy we've brought in a new major new discovery uh, center from um uh, funded by merck to king's cross to sit right next to the crick we ucb are setting up a billion dollar r d site in windlesham in surrey and novo set up a, a discovery uh, center in Oxford. So we've got three new discovery um, um, partners in the UK and I, you can't do without having pharma there. And so that's really important. The second thing that I think you're going to have to solve is that no, no Canadian <laughs> province in terms of healthcare data is probably big enough to compete. You know, you're, I don't know what BC is, what are you about 5 million people or 10 million, 5 million people. So you're about the same size as Scotland. Well, you know, it doesn't, the Scots can't play by themselves. They've got to be part of the overall play. And, you know, we, we're, we, we've we got 65 million records, 55 million in the UK. And it, it's just that extra step up. So I think working across Canada to try and integrate and make those records more interoperable would be pretty valuable. But you've got all the other bits. I mean, I don't see there's any reason why you can't do this. And I think um, as you bring up COVID, it's true. We saw all of our stakeholders that you described really come together. And in a lot of ways, Canadian innovation, as Dermot said, has really been at the forefront. So we've shown that we can do it. I guess what you just described um, as 20 years ago, I think many of us feel is 
is where we are. So can you talk about how did you bring, like, how did you bring the stakeholders together? We, uh, I talk about it often, and you referenced this at the beginning. I don't think there's any sector better positioned right now to both drive the economic recovery and competitiveness of our economy, broadly speaking, while addressing many of the complex issues that we have within our healthcare system. And you talked about a lot of them with respect to prevention, rising costs. I mean, there's just so many. So you seem to have been able to crack that nut about bringing the fact that not only is this important for the health system, but it's also important for the economy. Yeah, so I think I, I was telling, I think I told you and Dermot the story the other day that I, you know, I was at a CIHR review and um, uh, I just asked the simple question, given the amount of money you put into a state funded single payer healthcare system, how much do you think that state funded single payer healthcare care system should contribute to real economic growth and, and, and what is their responsibility to help with the economic viability of the whole country? And, and when I said it, it was very clear that that was a bit of a shock to everybody in the room. It's something that we think about all the time in the UK. And I, it's just, I, you know, I, I understand why people think they're two different worlds, but they're not two different worlds. They're the same world. Yeah. And if, if the only relationship is transactional, you won't get the kind of uplift that we've got in the UK. So that, I think, is a really important bit of the puzzle. The, the other piece has been... I mean, we have really tried to work as a community and to work across boundaries where we can, working uh, collaboratively with industry, large and small, trying to make sure that there are interfaces where we meet each other. The Academy of Medical Sciences had a very, very aggressive view about trying to bring more industry scientists into the academic sort of golden circle, and that has proved to be really, really valuable. And, and uh, governments have responded to the notion that we're working together by giving us more money. So you can go to government and you get industry over there saying we need this and you get academia saying we need that. And you get the NHS saying, yeah, we think it's all terrific. Guess what? You get more money. So, you know, there, there's a lot of mutual benefit to everybody. So it's a, it, look, it's a cultural thing. It won't happen overnight, but I don't think it also needs to take 20 years. You can probably do it faster than we did. I know that Dermot has to go, so I'm going to ask him to uh, say some parting comments. But then I have another question for you, John, as after Dermot has made his closing remarks. Oh, I, I, I just want to reinforce that last point because I, I was at the last session and listening to people from industry, and it's really clear that our objectives and their and, and the industry objectives, our objectives in the academic health space and the industry objectives are totally aligned right now. And, and they never have been more aligned. So, uh, so it's really critical that we seize this opportunity as the inflection point. But the inflection point that sort of began in the UK with the Academy and, and with Oscar and all, all of those other developments, we have the, we have the capacity, but we have to, we have to craft and, and articulate a common message and we have to repeat it, I think, which is a, an, another important thing, the power of repetition, uh, repeating that message and, and keeping that on message uh, throughout all of our dialogue. So, so that's that's my parting comments. Uh, thanks, thanks really much, uh, so much, John. Uh, that was really fantastic, and yeah. and I'm, I'm sure everybody in the audience has has uh, has uh, uh, benefited from um, from hearing some of the uh, some of the perspectives that that you've that you've uh, shown us regarding life sciences in the UK. So. Thank you. I'll have to uh, take care. We'll see you Thank soon. You, yeah. So, John, you talked uh, talked about an area that, as many people know, is a great passion of mine, and it is data. And I also am a certified privacy professional, and I'm always struck with the fact that privacy seems to, privacy problems seem to be the, the answer frequently. And I've been known to say I think that's a red herring sometimes, not all the time, but. You live in the world of the most stringent privacy policies globally right now and have created um, an amazing data structure. So I think I would be interested, I think people will be interested to know because we, 
We, we've talked about a lot of polarizing topics today and data in Canada is one of them. There, are, there is a big, big debate about to the extent that data should be used by all the stakeholders and how do you do that in a compliant manner. And I'd love to hear how you were able to crack that nut in the UK, especially in light of you have some of the most stringent policies um, that exist globally. Yeah, it, I, so I don't want to paint this as being perfect, but it's and it's required a lot of iterations to get to where we need to get to. But there, there, there are really two approaches that we've taken to this. One is that I think there is a tendency to believe that people don't want their uh, health records to be used, even in an anonymized form. Um, and no one ever asked the people. So when you ask the people, you find that actually most of them, particularly when they can see the altruistic benefits to lots of people who are sick, are actually pretty enthusiastic, provided you don't stick them on the front page of the newspaper and you don't you govern them in sensible and uh, effective ways. And, and so we've spent a lot of time on data governance. We, we had an overly complex set of data governance and that's now got a lot better. So, um, we're, we're trying to simplify the data governance. We're trying to open up the data sets. We've gradually migrated a lot of the data sets into a single vehicle where we can have a single data governance, res re governance responsibility and getting interoperability between the different, because of course the other thing in the healthcare systems, is they've got a million different data sets. So you've got to get them in a place where you can hook them up in a sensible way. So that, now that's taken a long time, but we're really, really much closer to that endpoint at the moment. And, and I, I, I think it's doable. The, the other thing, which of course we've done with great success is that rather than just use the data in an anonymized fashion, we're also very good at asking people whether we can use it. So the whole Genomics England experiment was all consented people. People said, yeah, of course you can use it and we'll consent to give, give you my data and all that stuff. The UK Biobank has all consented. Our future health, all 5 million people will be fully consented. So, you know, people, if you talk to them properly and you explain to them that you're going to look after their data, they see the real benefits of sharing that more widely for, for altruistic benefits. So, I, you know, it's a combination of the two, but it, you know, you mustn't be, I think some jurisdictions and I, some of our European colleagues have got themselves down a very, very deep rabbit hole with this from which they're never gonna reemerge, I'm afraid, because they've got such such data protection rules that they, nobody can look at anything. Mm -hmm. and, and as a result, when COVID came along, they couldn't tell you anything about who had COVID and who went to hospital and who had a test and all the rest of it. So mm -hmm. it's not in people's interest really to be too protective. No, and uh, you know, there's been quite a bit of work uh, in British Columbia on this, a number of public deliberations and which I had the opportunity to participate in one where the question was, do people want their data used for research? And most people thought it already was happening. Yeah, and exactly. then many people very quickly jumped to, I want my clinician who's treating me to have the most current information. Yeah. And, you know, that has to happen with data, especially if you're going to be talking about genomics and prevention and that, that whole area that you were embarking on. That's all about, all about data and um, being able to leverage it responsibly is um, something we'd like to probably explore with you more fully. So I'm conscious of the time and uh, I want to be very respectful to your time, John, because I've already asked you to come back and speak again when the Life Sciences Strategy 2.0 comes out. So I can't take up too much time now at the expense of the future. But thank you so much. This was a big gift to our community for you to take the time. I know how busy you are and uh, we all really, really appreciate it. And um, there's been lots of comments in the chat and you've given us lots to think about as we embark on, um, on our own life sciences strategy in British Columbia and Canada. No, well, very, very, very best of luck to you. I think you've got all the components. You just need to get them mixed up properly and then off you go. So I'm sure you'll be successful if you, if you, if you focus on it. Okay, Take well, care. Thank, you. thank you very much, John. I'm now gonna wrap this up. Thank you all for joining us. Um, 
there is a recording of this session that will be sent out to everybody that registered. So, um, you know, please uh, look out for that or reach out to Ryan for any information. I want to thank again, um, Sir John Bell, as well as Dr. Dermot Kelleher, who had to leave. Um, I want to thank our sponsors of this event, who made this possible, the conference partner Pfizer Canada, event sponsors AbbVie and Innovative Medicines Canada, and our event supporter, uh, Digby Global. This event wouldn't have been possible without the hard work of many people, Ryan and Tim in particular, who have been extremely busy this morning as we had some technical glitches at the beginning. So thank you for your calmness and uh, ability to keep uh, executing as, as things continually come up. We also had a committee behind the scenes working on this uh, event that has put countless hours into thinking about content, thinking about speakers, uh, lots of debates about what we wanted to cover and what we didn't want to cover. So a big thanks to that committee, Tom Digby, Ann Babineau, Ann Stevens, Lana Janes, Pete Simpson, and Bob Dawson. It's been a fun journey getting to this point, and I hope you've enjoyed the day as much as I have. And with that, we'll close off this webinar, and thank you very much, everyone, for joining us. <laughs>